Oh, thank you very much. Please sit down. Wow. <laughs> wow, what an introduction. I wish my mom and dad had been here to hear it. <laughs> My father would have been proud. My mother would have believed every word. Where'd he go? I, he's heard me speak before. He's out of here. <laughs> oh, and he didn't mention any of the elections I lost. What I, I'm just so pleased to have this chance to be with you. And I lost an election in 1972, another one in 1974. I lost an election for, a, well, I've, and then, of course, I'm the only person in the history of civilization to have been a sitting senator who lost his seat to a dead opponent. So, I mean, I, I, I uh, and to have such a substantial introduction was a matter of great uh, satisfaction to me. And, and he didn't have to mention the football record. I hold two records in football. Uh, at Hillcrest High School, we had the most losing. We didn't lose all of our games. We didn't. We tied one. Uh, and I happen to have been the most losing football governor in the history of the state. And let me tell you what's painful. If you're the governor and your team is losing, you cannot leave the stadium. <laughs> if you're ahead 45 to nothing, you can walk out. Nobody thinks it's bad to walk out on boys who are really killing the other guys. But if your guys are taking it in the neck or the throat or both, you got to stay there to the bitter end. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, anyhow, what a, what a pleasure it is to be with you. Let me just say something at the outset. That I believe the law enforcement responsibility that you represent, the teams that you represent, the sort of integrated effort that I see expressed in this meeting is at the heart of what freedom and liberty are about. No decisions that I know of more directly impact the lives of individuals than the decision as to whether or not they should be prosecuted for an offense against the, the laws of a jurisdiction. And the decision not to prosecute is sometimes as difficult or more difficult than the decision to prosecute. And this decision has been allocated to individuals who are the U.S. attorneys who work in conjunction with law enforcement officials who prepare cases, who develop evidence, and who are a part of a team to provide for safety and security in our culture. I am profoundly grateful for the fact that you have served. A number of you have come to me over the last uh, 12 or 15 hours and thanked me for the fact that I was involved in your appointment. The flow of gratitude should be in the other direction. As governor, I had the privilege of appointing well over 200 judges. And the biggest disaster I could think of would be the necessity to appoint someone to a judicial position or a law enforcement position of such sensitive importance to liberty, which is the core value of the American culture, and not have good people to appoint. Can you imagine what it would do to you if you had to appoint someone who you believed would render service that was absent integrity or absent comp competence? And I thank you for serving. For you to thank me for the appointment is nothing. Appointment is a stroke of a pen. Service is the dedication of a life. So I want to thank you for that. And the dedication of a life, when it's invested in the saving of lives, is its highest calling and its highest order. I'm I, I so pleased that Attorney General Sessions, a year ago, decided to re-inspire, to breathe new breath of life, or in, in, invigorate the program of Project Safe Neighborhoods. Jeff Sessions is a person for whom I have the highest regard. And I have extremely high regard for Bill Barr, and I think the president should have the people that he wants and he's confident in, but I want to thank Jeff Sessions for what he means to the Project Safe Neighborhood program because it means something special to the United States of America and to citizens of this great country.
got to be careful. I'll get wound up here, and who knows? I don't want to infringe the next speaker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it reminds me of the story of the, of the kid in church, and his, he's not familiar with the process and procedure, and his father has taken him there, and the father asks, you know, he asks about this, that, and the other, and one thing or another. Finally, the preacher takes off his watch, and he says, what does that mean? And his father says, it means nothing at all. So I, I put my watch there to remind me. And I, I guess the president may get it if I forget it here. I, I know, I hope, he, I hope he doesn't need one. Liberty, in my judgment, is the core value of the American culture. The core value. We could recite together the phrases that we learned as children. We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and among these is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's at the center of that trilogy because life without liberty, well, who knows what it's worth. And you sure can't pursue happiness without liberty. It is the core value. It was the core value from the beginning in the harbor of Boston. And so glad to see Mike Sullivan here. He, he and I have the privilege of practicing law together. He was the U.S. attorney in Boston when PSN started. And uh, he's sitting next to Johnny Sutton, who was the U.S. attorney in Texas when PSN was started as a formal program. And Johnny always brags about things being bigger in Texas. You know, does that surprise anyone? But he said that there are 2,200 PSN prosecutions at his hand. And I'm thinking of how many people are alive today because those prosecutions took place. And Mike, of course, prosecuted uh, lots of those cases in Boston, but Mike eventually became the uh, director of the, well, he directed the alcohol, tobacco, firearms. So uh, let me just say to you that if you ever decide to depart from the path you're on, you have a good future ahead of you. These guys uh, are not only just helping America, they've been helping me, and that's really important to me. So I'm glad to see you in the audience today. Thank you for being here. Liberty is the core. I, went in, I was started this because I was talking about Boston. You know, when the guys in Boston dump the tea into the harbor, they call themselves the sons of liberty. Liberty is what America was about. It is what America is about. Matter of fact, Patrick Henry's, I know not what, what is it? Uh, is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be bought at the expense of liberty? Give me liberty or give me death. It's what, it, it's what makes America special. And I believe that Project Safe Neighborhood is a project that is focused on liberty, ultimately the freedom of people to be secure from the threat of violence, bodily harm, murderous assault in their own neighborhoods. And what's important to me is to note that this is the reason the Justice Department was called into existence. I have to confess that I remained ignorant for too long about why the Justice Department was created. I kind of thought it was just there. And I knew there'd been an attorney general ab initio in this country. I'm throwing a Latin phrase once in a while to make you think I went to law school. <laughs> but the Justice Department didn't exist for nearly 100 years after America came into existence. The Justice Department came into existence in 1870, on the 1st of July, 1870. And it came into existence following a tremendous wave of violent behavior following the Civil War. I had the privilege of speaking with some folks from these jurisdictions. A U.S. attorney from Memphis and I talked this morning. There were riots in Memphis in 1866. About four dozen people killed in the tensions that were over whether or not African American, black Americans were going to have the liberties and freedoms that the Civil War had been fought to try and make possible. And less than 60 days later, I believe, in New Orleans, Louisiana, both black Americans and 
people who were called white Republicans at the time who were marching together to make sure that people could recognize the rights of individuals, another four dozen people killed. And Ulysses S. Grant, the president of the United States starting in 1969 in that interval, he decides that it's important to secure the rights and liberties of people because there is an epidemic of violence that goes across the South as a result of the prevalence of the Ku Klux Klan. And he appoints, in, in a stroke of genius, he appoints an attorney general of the United States who was an officer of the Confederate Army, a fellow named Amos Ackerman. And he becomes the attorney general, and he begins a crusade to defend the liberties of citizens of the United States against those who would seek to deprive them of those liberties with violent in behavior that was designed to intimidate them. And, and let me just say this, it, it was a scourge of violence. And there were dozens and dozens of murders and violent acts that included horrendous beatings and the like designed to intimidate people and to cause them to abandon the course that they, we had set for liberty for all Americans. And this is, the, this is the situation which calls forth the Justice Department. It comes into existence to defend the liberties of American citizens. And absent its existence, those liberties were fast evaporating. Just to give you an idea of what Attorney General Ackerman did in the first year or two when he was Attorney General, 3,300 indictments against the Ku Klux Klan and situations like there had been in Mississippi in the previous year where there had been something like 71 murders and no one had been sent to prison for those murders. Those began to be restrained. The the liberty of Americans to operate absent the coercive impacts of brutal criminal activity that's designed to, to intimidate them and coerce them, that liberty is at the core of what it means to be American and what it means for us to have a culture, and it's at the very core of what the Justice Department was called into existence to do. And each of us has this opportunity. I mean, I have an opportunity because law enforcement is, is simply too important to leave to government alone. So every citizen in our culture has a responsibility to participate in law enforcement. But the law enforcement is not for the purpose of statistics. It's not for the purpose of st the statistics of how many prosecutions you can have. It's not for the purpose of really punishing people ultimately. It's not for the purpose of incarcerating or putting people in prison, ultimately. It is for the purpose of liberating people so that they can live lives free of the coercive impacts of destructive violence. That's what I believe this Project Safe Neighborhood is all about. And I think it's so important that we understand that, I, I, you know, we give awards and I love to give them. I love going to these uh, PSN efforts that we had across the country, and I can't tell you where all the... Some of you have mentioned to me that we were together in Denver and other people at different locations at these conferences. And we give awards out. But I thought to myself, you know, don't do this to get your name on a plaque. Do Project Safe Neighborhoods to get someone else's name off a tombstone. That's what this is about. This is about America's fundamental liberty of freedom. And freedom is the core of who we are. It's the reason our Constitution is stru structured the way it is. We have fragmented power because we don't want to infringe liberty. We don't want liberty to be fractured, so we fracture the power of government. And before there was an antitrust division, before there was an antitrust law, before there was any law about immigration, before there was any, any law relating to the environment, 
The Justice Department is called into existence to protect the liberty of American citizens. And that's, that's a special, special responsibility. Now let me just say, I like to think about this in terms of lives that were saved. First, I should confess that I wish this were my idea. It hadn't been. Some of you were around when the idea was born, when it was brought into existence. You, have, you should have great satisfaction in thinking about it, but it began to under, with the understanding that there are a relatively few number of bad actors who do volumes of the criminal activity. And if we would focus our efforts on those individuals when they're apprehended in the commission of a crime, make sure we do everything we can to remove them from the stream of criminal activity, if you will. If 80% if of the crime is done by 20% of the people, putting some of those, or a lot of those 20 percenters away will have a, a big impact on what happens. And sure enough, in the first few years of Project Safe Neighborhoods, after it had been tried in multiple administrations in pilots and the like, we had the privilege of of saying, this is worthwhile, this is doing. And this is even before this fantastic Michigan State study. This Michigan State study is spectacular. I, I'm not really very good at statistics. You could talk to the statistics professor at any school I've been to and find that out. <laughs> but uh, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know that if you have a concentrated PSN program in one city and the homicide rate. According to the Michigan State study, the homicide rate goes down 10% in that city. And in a parallel similar city where nothing was done, the homicide rate was going up by 10%. That is something of substantial import. And this is not something that relates to whether it's nice or convenient. When we're talking homicide rate, there's something irreversible about a homicide. Prevention becomes the important thing about homicides because remediation is just without, uh, it's not in, 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 in the picture. And when I think about in the first uh, seven years of PSN, we had an overall crime reduction of 4.1, violent crime protection of 4.1%. And that's the, that's the least favorable way to state it. That includes a bunch of territories in the United States where there isn't much crime. But the low-hanging fruit in the neighborhoods where people were really being intimidated, where students couldn't take their school books and walk to school for fear, and where people who couldn't go to the store in the evening without being injured and the, and the like. Those are areas where the Michigan State study shows that we have these dramatic impacts, sometimes as much as a 40% decrease in this kind of violent activity. You always know that in the early years, the, the, I suppose the, the low-hanging fruit is the easiest to get, but there has been a continuing harvest of activities that would result in the saving of lives. Now, a quick point or two, because this watch of mine, it, it slipped into high gear just as soon as I put it down and started <laughs> going faster. Don't let people talk you out of this. Don't let the left talk you out and say, we have too many people in our prisons. We have too many people in our graveyards from murders. There's a, someone said there's about 15, 16,000 people a year that are murdered in this country. Every year. A 1% decline in the murder rate is 150 people who will be alive. A 10% decline in the murder rate, which the Michigan State study indicates was possible in a number of communities, would nationwide, that would be 1,600 people. It's hard sometimes, though, to think of who those people are. The defendant always stays, stands there well, well identified. We know who he is, and it's, there's a sympathetic deal. He had a mom who cared for him, and he has family, who knew, so we've got to be careful about that, and I, I, I'm in favor of all that, but we don't know who we're saving. Had it not been for somebody's aggressive action against a murderer at some point or another, you might not be here. Instead of on a certificate for the Justice Department, it might be on the tombstone. And I don't like to talk about statistics alone, but if we can save 1,600 people a year in this country by having 
a sensitivity to identifying those individuals who are most likely to be imposing the murderous consequence of violent crime, we ought to be doing it. And I know you can do it, but don't be talked out of it by people who say, well, we've got too many people in the jail. We can't, we can't prosecute these. Don't be talked out of it by judges. The federal judges in particular are addicted to intellectual cases, you know, like antitrust and things that require, you know, and I think we need those cases. And they came to me when I was attorney general. Someone said, you've got to get these gun-toting crooks out of my courtroom. I said, you know, we need them in your courtroom. And if you don't like them in the courtroom, maybe you need to find someplace else to make a living. It's our responsibility. <laughs> then they said I could find another place to make a living. <laughs> this is important. This is liberty. This is the core. It's why the department was brought into existence. All the other aspects of the department are important. I don't mean to devalue them, but this is at the core of what it means to be a free people, to be free from the coercive threat of destructive violence, including people being killed. It's what justice is all about. I think they still say it in the grade school. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation under God with li what? Liberty and justice. Boy, if the right one don't get you the left one. These belong together. And when we sustain liberty by imposing justice, we make a difference. One last thing. This is, this is, since they brought up high school, I'm going to do something that's high school corny. Uh, the word justice to me has a special meaning. It's the only department of government that has a value for a name. I love it. And justice, the J stands for judgment. That's what you've got to have good judgment. Each one of you exercises judgment, takes wisdom. I pray to God that he'll grant you the wisdom to have good judgment. U stands justice, J-U. I'm going to prove I can spell the word here in a minute. <laughs> J-U stands for understanding. We need to be understanding. We have to, it's part of making the decisions we make. At the heart of justice are three letters, S-T-I. And for me, that stands for simply total integrity. That's who we are. We're the truth. We're uncontaminated. We're not politics. We're just a simply total integrity. J-U-S-T-I. C stands for, stands for compassion. We've got to understand that there are people who are in difficulty and we can't be so hard about things that we don't understand what the real human needs are. And the last thing is not the least thing. The E stands for equity. Our Constitution provides a basis for equal justice and equal protection of the laws. I, I, want our, I don't want people in some neighborhoods not to have the equal protection of other neighborhoods. They all deserve the protection of the law to live in liberty with opportunity. When Emma Lazarus <coughs> wrote the poetry for the base of the Statue of Liberty, he said, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these the homeless tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. She probably did something there that has inspired me uh, for a long time, and that is she identified the core value that makes America great, that allows us to, to be exceptional as a country. Now, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses. Yeah, that, that sounds like, hey, what are you doing? The wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Who are you inviting? The tempest tossed. Wow. But I left out a phrase there. Yearning to breathe free. That's what liberty is about, breathing free, having a desire for freedom and having an environment that respects it and protects it. The respect for liberty and the protection of liberty is the core value of the American culture and its best friend is the United States Department of Justice 
and those individuals who cooperate with it. Thank you very much, and God bless you.